like to start with a question. Um, and the question is, how much of your perception do you think that you create moment to moment? How much of your reality is actually real and how much of it happens on the inside? Okay, so, so it, I've, I've asked this question in so many different places now. In the minimum that anybody says is about 30%, which that in itself I find really fascinating. So inherently and intuitively we know that some portion of our reality isn't actually real, it's made up in here. We know it, but we don't live like that. Like we live like real's real. And what we're experiencing is it. And my it is the same as everybody else's it. And if your it's different than my it, then you're wrong. <laughs> but when you ask the question, there's something we intuitively know that that's not really the case. And those of you who are uh, fans of TED uh, might have seen Sean Aco's brilliant TED talk on the happiness advantage. If you haven't, I'd highly recommend it. And Sean's a Harvard guy. And his research has shown that somewhere around about 90% of our experience is not actually the world, but instead the lenses that we see the world through. So according to Harvard research, which is frankly good enough for me, <laughs> about 10% of what we experience as real is actually real, and the rest is made up to some degree or another. There's a grown psychology around at the moment called Three Principles, and uh, to my knowledge at the moment, it's the fastest grown psychology. And the Three Principles guys suggest that 100% of our experience isn't what they call the world of form, but actually what we think about the world of form. We don't experience what's going on on the outside, we experience what we think about is going on on the outside. And I think it's an amazing thought just to have. Like empowering, but scary. Like, it's suggesting that we pretty much make it all up. We pretty much make up our experience day to day, moment to moment. Which is all good until you come to run leadership programs. And if we all make it all up, then how do we get better as leaders? And how do we improve organizations? And this brings us on to my hypothesis. And I've done my best to make it grand and academic and complex, and it's this. <laughs> I think that one of the key differentiating factors between those that are highly successful leaders and the rest is that highly successful business leaders are better guessers. Highly successful leaders in social situations and in families are just better guessers. Because let's be frank, if we're making it all up, then there isn't a right until after the event. Like we can pretend, well, this is the right thing to do, but we don't know until afterwards. And even when there is a right, then there'll still be a group of people whose perception is such that that right was wrong anyway. Look, we've made all of this money, well, that's a bad thing to do. So if there isn't, if we don't know what right is, and even when we are right, some of the times it's wrong, then the only way we can be better leaders in whatever our field is, is just to be better at guessing. So if that's the case, then I think there are three things that we can do that will help us to be perceived as better leaders in the world that we operate in. So the first thing is just to make more decisions. Like if we make more decisions at every opportunity, then we're going to get more right. You know, whether that's developing the gut instinct, whether it's working the muscle, whether it's getting more in line with our intuition, I don't really know. And it doesn't mean don't consult, and it doesn't mean don't delegate. I think that's a key skill of a leader. But what it does mean is we don't procrastinate. We don't shirk decisions when they're there. If we make more decisions, then I think we'll become better guessers. Now, I think there is a challenge to that. Some people say, well, that's all very well and good in your field. You know, you're working with people, and you, know, you can only read people to a certain extent. You can guess with people. But some things in the world are data-driven. 
It's all about the data, and it's data that helps us to be right or not. Now, I, I've sat in enough board meetings where there have been strategy papers or market predictions passed around the table to make decisions on. So the data is there and it's clear, yet there are as many decisions and opinions on what we should do next as there are people in the room to suggest that actually, even in data-driven organizations, it's not the data that forms the decisions, it's what the people think about the data that forms the decisions. I was sharing um, an outline of the talk I was gonna give with a, a mentor a couple of days ago, and she shared some research with me going back to 1962, where scientists were analyzed and scientists that had formed a hypothesis were then unconsciously blind to data that contradicted the hypothesis. Even scientists make it up. The second thing is one of the single most important things that I've discovered over the last couple of years. And, and if there was only one thing you were gonna do from today, I'd encourage you to notice your thinking. Now, let me just give you a bit, of a, a bit of a metaphor and a bit of a frame for this. So, when I talk about thoughts and thinking, I want you to imagine that we have this stream of thoughts, like, flowing through our heads all of the time. How many thoughts do you think we have in a day? 80,000. 80, it could be 100,000. It could be... I'm going to use that from now on. It's 80,000. From now on, it's 80,000. It works for me. So however many, you know, thoughts we have streaming through, some of them we notice, some of them we don't, every now and then we stop a thought and we grab it and we grab a torch and we shine a light on that torch or set of to uh, on that thought or set of thoughts. And our experience becomes the thoughts that we shine the torch on most. Our experience is as a result of the thoughts that we spend most time on. And we call that real. And we experience it as real. Like another very simple, but I think really important kind of example of it is in the morning. And I'm sure whether you admit it or not, you'll all have had this experience where you get ready to go out for work and you go and stand in front of the mirror and you look in the mirror and you go... Where did that grey hair come from? And when did, like, when did this happen? And when did I get, when did this happen? So you go and get changed because you think it's about the colour scheme you're wearing, right? Or the clothes that you're wearing. You know, the clothes have shrunk. Now you've got bigger. So you get changed and you go and stand in front of the mirror and you just look and it just feels the same again. And after about 15 minutes, you get out, you give up and you sl slouch out the work. And on other mornings, you get up and you throw something on, you stand in front of the mirror and you go, Look, all right, a day, and you leave. <laughs> and on the days where you think you look dreadful, you spend 15 minutes in front of the mirror. And on the days where you think you look good, you spend 15 seconds in front of the mirror. And then we wonder why most people in this room have got a fairly negative self-perception of their self-image. And I just think that even if all we did was spend 15 minutes on the days where we think we look good and 10 seconds on the day that we think we look bad, we totally change our perception of ourselves, at least physically. Does this sound familiar? And this is thought creating our experience. So that's why number two on this list is like, it's so important to me. I want you to start noticing your thinking. So at times when you have some kind of negative or unhelpful emotion, whether it's stress or pressure or anger or frustration or just stuckness, I just want you to stop for a moment and I want you to notice what it is that you're thinking about. And what I found incredibly interesting over the last couple of years is the more that I do that, the more that I realize my emotion is driven by what I'm thinking about, not by what's happening on the outside. I had a really interesting experience a couple of weeks ago. I've been around this stuff on thought for about three years. I've been really seeking to understand it. I think I'm getting closer to understanding it. And I was sat in my house, and I noticed I was feeling particularly frustrated with my wife. <laughs> 
which was interesting because she was in bed asleep. <laughs> so because I'm enlightened, right, I go, okay, so what's going on here? And I, I thought about it and I realized um, earlier on in the afternoon, she'd said something that I just, just, you know, just triggered me. Just, it just irked me slightly. She didn't mean it, but she said it. Oh, I wasn't very, well, I'm not sure you meant it like that, but that wasn't a very nice thing to say. And then that had been fine, and we'd fed the kids and had our food and bathed the kids and sat and watched the telly, and then she'd gone to bed. And what I was really annoyed about was the argument that I'd had with her in my head. <laughs> now, you can laugh, but she'd said some really nasty things to me in my head. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, we just do that all the time. We get so annoyed with people in situations, not because of the people of the situations, but because of what we think about the people in situations. So I just really encourage you to start noticing your thinking. Because the other thing that I've realized is the hardest problems to solve are the ones that don't exist yet. <laughs> so I, like, I first started playing around this. I, I, I just worked with professional footballers, and I was working with a guy who was really talented. He was playing the second tier down in, in football. And um, I was speaking to him after a game, and he said, you know what, there was 20,000 people there. It was such an important game. And all I could think about was, what's going to happen if I lose my house? And I went, what? And he said, well, I, I realized if I play this badly again, then I'm probably going to get dropped. And if I'm dropped, um, I'll be in the reserves. If I play in the reserves for any length of time, I'm going to get so frustrated. So I'm going to keep on playing badly, and at the end of 18 months, they're not going to offer me a new contract. If I don't get a new contract here, I'm going to drop down a league. The wages aren't anywhere near as good. I'm never going to be able to afford this house, and eventually I'll default on my mortgage, and I'll get my house taken off me. And I went, wow, I could get really stressed if I went down there as well. And of course, that was a huge problem to solve, not just because like, saving your house is big, but mainly because it didn't exist at all. And what he needed to do, the problem he needed to solve, was to pass the ball better. <laughs> and he was trained to do that, so that was relatively easy. But I think we get wrapped up and sucked down these, I call them thought rabbit warrens all of the time. We start off here and we end up somewhere over here. The other thing that I, I want you to take away about this notice in your thinking is, it's not about positive thinking. Like, I'm a huge fan of positive thinking, but this isn't about positive thinking, because what I've noticed is, when I notice my thinking, then it just seems to take the energy out of the thought, and when the energy goes out of the thought, then the emotion seems to disappear, and I become much clearer on then what I need to do without having to be positive about it as well. So, number two, I just really encourage you to go away and start noticing your thinking. Now, you'll probably spot already that I've cheated on the third point because there's four sub-points. So in 10 years in being around leadership, my, my favorite leadership work is still by uh, two American guys called Jim Coozes and Barry Posner, and they are um, outstanding, I think. And one of the things that differentiates it is they go out and they survey and they study followers. Like, I think it's brilliant to work out is what does Barack Obama do or what does... Um, uh, the great leaders of the day do, but we aren't them. So what are the characteristics that followers want from leaders? And I think if we can do more of that, then we'll become, become more successful. And in 30 years of doing the research all the way around the world, with between 750,000 and a million followers, every time they do the research, there are four things that consistently come to the top as being the four things that people want from leaders. We want our leaders to be honest, and actually, I think it's more about being congruent and authentic. We want our leaders to do what they say on the tin. We want to believe in them, and to believe in them, they've got to follow up their words with actions. We've got to know what they stand for, and then they've got to line up their actions with what they say they stand for. Being honest is two-thirds more important to followers than the other three of the top four put together. In other words, if you do number two, three, and four on that list without doing number one, people still fo won't follow you with the same energy and intensity. Number two on the list, we want our leaders to be forward-facing. Like, again, it's a basic human need. We want to we wanna know where we're going. We've, we want to know that there's something to aim for. We even use the term light at the end of the tunnel. And as leaders, that's why vision is so important. Number three on the list is inspiring. I think it's a really interesting one because I think in this country, we've got a challenge with inspiring. 
in that we think it's all about kind of high-fiving and fist bumping and chest bumping, you know? And we kind of go, well, we, we can't do that. So here's your self-audit for being inspiring. Do you leave people with more energy than they had before you had contact with them? And if you do that on a consistent basis, I think you can call yourself inspiring. Because you can do it whether it's a good message or a bad message, face-to-face, -face, over the phone, or by email. And then the final one on the list is we want our leaders to be competent. And that's competent as leaders, not just as subject matter experts. It's more important that we see you have the capability and the skills and the combination of things to lead us into a brighter future than that you're very good at the job that I do. So with that, I'd just like to leave you with two final thoughts. Number one, if we make it all up in effect, how are you making your world up? And more importantly, how are you helping your children to make their worlds up? And secondly, I, I absolutely fundamentally believe that leadership is developable. How are you going to be a better leader for your people from today? Thank you.